So, yeah, Paul just needs to say so, to kick things off. And so, I hope that, that Stuart gets on and uh, join us tomorrow. So, my name is Ferdinand Warren, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a, a project called Cordex, which is uh, a machine intelligence based on Jack Hawkins' hierarchical temporal memory. years later, uh, a rather more important life-changing event for me. I uh, tried uh, producing the first 40,000 prime numbers, because uh, the, the heat sink wasn't really too cool on it. So, um, so I'd just like to give a bit of background to uh, why I'm uh, spending my entire, betting the rest of my life on uh, this particular exercise. Um, there's another hero of mine, Isaac Asimov, and uh, this is something he said a long time ago uh, when he was talking about science. And another hero of mine uh, came up with this rather nice quote about big data. Um, a guy called Dan Ariely, who's made a science for, out of uh, irrationality. Um, and really the takeaway is that machine learning at the moment, still needs an awful lot of human intelligence in order to make it work. Uh, running the actual algorithm is often the easiest part of the whole process. There's the vast bulk of the work is in uh, identifying, preparing, sorting through the data. The rest of it is about humans identifying good models to try and uh, work with the data. And then literally 1% of the work is in just running your models over the data. And then, of course, the, the other 90% is uh, interpreting the results, which is also a human exercise. Um, this is something I found yesterday while I was lightning putting through this thing together. So uh, that's the kind of thing that comes out if you uh, don't have a very good kind of generalization <laughs> model. Um, so why is this important? Well, the answer is because uh, people can't trust other people because other people have personal agendas. So they tend to place uh, an, over, an overly strong uh, trust in uh, machines. So every single detail of the financial world from your personal credit history to when the next global meltdown is going to happen um, obviously, security, military decisions, uh, things like education, selection, recruitment, compensation, all done using uh, machine learning. Uh, climate change and environmental regulation, which has huge things, medicine, uh, deciding whether somebody is worth saving, whether somebody's worth putting in a certain position on a transplant list, etc. And uh, it just goes on and on. So, just to remind you what Isaac said. And he wasn't even talking about data. He was talking about knowledge being in, uh, in, in abundance and wisdom being in short supply. So we have an even bigger problem now where we have all this data which contains some information that we're looking for. And what we're trying to do is to extract the knowledge out of that and then see if it can help us to uh, the decisions that we make. Okay, so some potential avenues for improving this situation. Uh, incrementally improve the machine learning, you're just going to be fiddling with the 1%. Um, so the question is, can we improve or augment human intelligence? Um, and some of us are asking, can we identify the mechanisms of intelligence uh, within humans, and therefore can intelligent machines save us from our own irrationality? 
So the goal we're looking for is a kind of a joint machine human intelligence which can achieve something new. Okay, and the question that the people in my community are asking is what can neuroscience teach us about intelligence? Unfortunately, we've got a bit of a problem. It's actually a big data problem. And that's that the number of neuroscience papers that are being published every year is going the same way as all the other big data. Um, and that's yesterday's figures. And that's for 2013, it's one every 32 minutes. And uh, this, the little dip at the right hand side of that graph is because that's the year to date figure for uh, up till yesterday. And so far it's a run rate of 17 minutes. So there will be two or three papers published while I'm speaking on neuroscience. Okay. Okay, so the main concern about it's the only thing we know that has uh, the level of intelligence that we would, we would regard as intelligence, the brain. So I went to find out what the uh, brain is. And um, this, is a, this is a good one from the reliable Ambrose Bierce. So why study the brain? Well, obviously, traditional symbolic AI doesn't seem to work. Perhaps the brain holds the secret to intelligence. And we can learn a lot about ourselves, too. And that's actually one of the more important things. We can actually learn how do we do things, how, do, how does our learning go wrong, uh, how does our decision-making work, and stuff like that. So this guy is uh, the leader of the whole movement of hierarchical temporal memory. I couldn't find a better picture of him, unfortunately. Um, and uh, Jeff Hawkins, basically his, his main goals are to study the neocortex and establish its principles, and then to build intelligent machines based on these principles. And this is quite important. This is not another machine learning or neural network type of system. This is actually about studying the brain and then using those principles to see if we can do some, do some machine learning. Um, and that's an important distinction that a lot of people don't make. So he wrote a book called On Intelligence 2003, founded a company called Numenta in 2005, and built a piece of software called Nupic, uh, which is in Python and C++, unfortunately. And he open source Nupic, Oh, just about a year ago, and I joined the community then, and I've been over to California a couple of times in the past year uh, to meet everybody and to take part in uh, some, of the, some of the work that they've been doing. So, um, what is the neocortex? Well, that's the neocortex is actually of a monkey or a chimpanzee, um, but it's very, very similar. It's uh, very, very hard to tell them apart among, among species. Um, the neocortex itself, it means new crust and, or new bark, and it, it's actually the, literally the very, very surface couple of millimetres of what you see there. So this is what it looks like in, a, uh, in 3D. There's an animated GIF, which is literally the only animated GIF I ever saw, by the way. Um, but it shows, the, the, you can see all the wrinkly stuff. The stuff on the edges is the grey matter. Uh, which is the actual neocortex itself. The stuff in the in white is just connections. So about seventy five percent of the of the brain is neocortex, and about seventy or eighty percent of that is wiring. Uh, and it's just on the very surface that you actually get the the processing. So this is you know, there is an exam at the end of this, and you will have to memorize everything in this. And um, this is just a kind of. Uh, a map of the outside surface of the neocortex, and this is the uh, medial surface. Um, so you can see that it's, there's a whole lot of, these are basically just telling you where something is, rather than what it does, but every single uh, piece here has either one or many functions. So just some facts, it's about two millimeters thick, it's about 100 square centimeters, so it's a bit, about the size of a dinner napkin. There is, Estimates vary between 30 and 100 billion neurons, uh, which is the grey matter, and there's more than a trillion connections, uh, probably several, several trillion, which is the white matter, and it's the seat of intelligence. Uh, most importantly, it's hierarchical and uniform. So uh, if you take a, a microscope to any part of it, 
Uh, you can't tell where it is. It all looks exactly the same. And it looks the same across almost all mammals as well. So you can't even tell what kind of an animal it comes from. So this is a simplified schematic of the visual system of the macaque monkey. Um, we have something that's about four or five times as complex as this. Um, each of the blocks is uh, what's called a region, and it performs a certain function. And the, the input comes from the bottom and goes up to the top. And it goes through this, this circuitry, and that's just to uh, process visual information. So there's similar systems, but most of them are smaller for language, for hearing, for somatosensory, and so on. So the neocortex divide up into many regions. They form a hierarchy. Every region looks the same. Uh, every region is performing the same algorithm. And Jeff calls this the cortical learning algorithm, which he uh, has developed some detail on. So the six key principles of uh, hierarchical temporal memory are online learning from streaming data, hierarchy of memory regions, sequence memory, sparse distributed representations. All regions are both sensory and motor, and it's all controlled with attention. So uh, I'm just going to go through these quite quickly. Uh, so we have up to 10 million senses feeding the brain. So there's literally 10 million channels of information feeding uh, about 10 to 100 times per second into each of your brains right now this second. Uh, we cannot, under any circumstances, store that data. So what we do is we build live models from the, we build models from the live data, and everything, every single thing that you know and understand, has been uh, fed into you through those channels. Right? You start with absolutely nothing, and um, the models are constantly updated with new data. And okay, so they're in a hierarchy, and the sensory data enters at the bottom. Models are built in every region. Things change more slowly as you go up. So you're obviously hearing, I'm sending uh, hundreds of muscle commands into my throat right now. You're receiving a, a complex mixture of uh, sound waves, and those things are being <coughs> interpreted, and they end up being turned into words, and then the, those things get turned into concepts. Uh, and so that, goes, that, that happens higher and higher up in the hierarchy. Uh, the hierarchy is built out of sequences of sequences. So sequences of sound waves turn into sequences of phonemes, into sequences of words sequences of sentences and so on. So, uh, the hierarchy works upwards and downwards. And in fact, there's uh, five or 10 times as many connections going downwards, all the way to your ears, all the way to your retina, all the way to your skin. Uh, there's actually 10 times as many connections going down, which is modulating the data that's coming in. Um, the key thing uh, in HTM is sequence memory. Uh, all sensory data involves time. <coughs> We can, we can learn tricks about, like for example, uh, understanding still images, but uh, in fact, it's all, it, it's all stuff that happens over time. Um, sequence memory allows predictions, and Jeff believes that predictions are the key to intelligence. And the structure in data is elaborated over time. The sequences can be composed hierarchically. Um, and the main currency of HDM is sparse distributed representations. So in each region, there are many neurons, fewer active. Uh, the SDRs represent spatial patterns. So uh, the pattern of activity at any point shows you what that particular region is looking at. Um, the SDRs have many useful properties. They're fault tolerant, uh, massively so. Uh, they have semantic operations that you can combine, combine different SDRs together. Um, and they're uh, of enormous capacity. Um, so far, we've like they're basically you're when you talk about the numbers involved in even small SDRs, you're talking about the number of atoms in the universe multiplied by the number of seconds of the lifetime of the universe. That kind of capacity. And um, the key to understanding and building intelligent systems is, according to all of us, in in this sparse distributed representation. So every region is both sensory and motor. Um, behavior provides context for sensory data, so most of what you're experiencing is actually uh, directly as a result of things that you're doing. So everything you see is as a result of where you decide to look, for example. Um, I'm totally interacting with what I'm saying, but everything that you do involves exploring 
the information that you're getting. Uh, the structure in the model is navigated by your behavior and your neocortex learns to control the old brain. So a sequence memory is a sensory motor model of the world and that's really the basic kind of premise of the whole of HTM. Okay, I'll just quickly go through attention. It's used to manage the neocortex. It allows for planning, pre-visualization. Pre Novel data or anomalies can demand attention. Uh, and there's whole sub-hierarchies sub that can be switched on or off. And these, can, these things can be happen in milliseconds. Okay, so this is just a detail. This is a drawing from 1911 uh, of the six layers, uh, which varies between five and six, of neurons in the neocortex. And everywhere you look in the brain, it looks very, very similar to this. Um, and the thing on the left is a photograph of a real neuron. Um, in the top left corner, you can see that there are little spikes sticking out all along these branching dendrites, and those are where synapses are formed. They're called dendritic spines. And on the right is the cortical learning algorithm model neuron. So it looks, obviously, somewhat more complicated than a classic neural network feed-forward uh, uh, neuron. And the reason is, is because it's actually a little processing unit that's far more complicated than just adding up your inputs and sticking it through an S-wave and sending it out. Uh, the green at the bottom is the main feed forward for the neuron. Um, and it, it actually acts quite similarly to a feed forward neuron in that uh, it's like trunk connections coming in from the senses or from lower regions in the hierarchy. And it adds up the <coughs> ones that are connected to produce the green filling that you see there, which is, an act which is a, a potential to uh, fire the neuron. But the key difference is the stuff on the top, which is connected to neurons in the same layer. And basically, each of those branches is a coincidence detector. So uh, at any point in time, the, the currently active neurons are sending their activity to across the layer. and if enough of them happen to, to connect to this particular neuron, then that, that branch will go red and it'll tip the green up and cause a firing of that neuron. And the cross connections is what gives the uh, CLA its ability to predict the future. So basically what happens is, is that what you're seeing now, uh, if the system has seen something similar before, then it will have formed connections to future neurons. Oops. Um, it will have formed connections to the neurons that are going to fire next. And those neurons will be in a predictive state and they'll therefore be much more likely to fire. So at any given moment, you're not just seeing what you're seeing now, but you're actually predicting what you're going to see next. Um, and this is the whole algorithmic basis of that. So what what Jeff has done here is basically he's come up with a simplified algorithm. Like the, the reality is an awful lot more complicated than this in, in every possible dimension. But uh, this, this algorithm is sufficient to explain the core algorithm that, uh, that you see in, in the neuroscience. Um, so, just one sec, sorry. Okay, so I'll just talk briefly about Clortex, and I'll do so in the, in the, against the background of uh, what Numenta is doing, which is, which is Jeff's company. So, uh, NewPick has been in development since 2005. It's a partial implementation because basically the theory is still ongoing, so the, the software uh, is lagging somewhat behind it. It's written in Python and C++, um, and it's open source uh, and available at newmenta.org. So the strengths of NewPick are there's a very, very skilled and, and highly knowledgeable dev team at Numenta with Jeff leading it. Um, Numenta eat their own dog food. So uh, their product, Grok, which works on Amazon Web Services and provides anomaly detection, uh, uses NewPick at its core. And um, operates using a subset of the principles. Um, it's tunable using swarming on your data. Um, and that's basically you just Kind of, it's like a genetic algorithm that, that uh, figures out what kind of parameters to set for the, for the model. 
Um, it works really, really well on streaming scalar data. So things like machine gener generated, like machine load, temperatures, energy costs, and stuff like that. Um, there's a fantastic community that stretches from academia all the way to, uh, to engineering and students and data science people um, and developers. Uh, and I encourage you to check out the, the community. There's over a thousand people involved in it. Um, and there, I think there's heading for a hundred people who've been uh, involved in developing the code. So Nubic has some limitations, and it's just a personal opinion. Um, the code base has evolved over time, literally as the theory was being developed. So there's a kind of a, uh, it, it didn't really benefit from having been designed in one shot. Um, it's difficult or scary to rewrite for flexibility. I think you closure people will know all about this kind of uh, legacy issues. Um, uses OO with large coupled classes, something like 1,500 to 2,000 lines of code per class. Um, and you, the only way really to kind of mutate the thing is to use swarming to find parameters. You don't really have kind of uh, real-time control over what it's doing. And it's quite difficult to extend it beyond this use case of the screening scale of the streaming scalar use case. So uh, this is just really an interlude. So uh, the same guy again. So I started out really with if I had a million books and had a team of twenty of you guys to do this, then uh, what were what would the requirements be? So the first thing that's important to me, because I'm, I'm actually just as important, interested in how the brain works as, uh, as building software to do it. Uh, for me and for Jeff and for any of the research end of things, it needs to be, there needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the theory and what you're looking at when you're dealing with the software. Because if there's a, if there's a hysteresis between those two things, then you the theory people become dissociated and, the, and the, the kind of high level things become dissociated from the nuts and bolts of the, of the software. Um, and part of that is that it needs to be transparently understandable. So a, a neuroscientist should be able to read the code and say, no, that's not how it should work. Uh, again, this is preaching to the choir here, directly observable data, right? So instead of having stuff hidden inside, encapsulated, layers of this, that, and the other. What you're talking about should be literally on the surface. Okay. It should be sufficiently performant. And what that means is that uh, if you have resources, then you should be able to use them. If you don't have that much resources, then you should still be able to make some progress. Um, you need to be able to <coughs> take out useful metrics out of the system. That's quite a difficulty at the moment. Um, and it needs to have appropriate platforms, so it needs to be as portable as possible, it needs to run on a wide range of machines, it needs to be uh, scalable, uh, and so on. So just direct analogy to theory, that's just uh, the details of that. I, um, this is, that's more for the, uh, for the experts in that. Um, but uh, this, this is something that uh, actually got me on the road to, uh, that ended up uh, using Clojure. Um, about eight months ago, and um, I had no no knowledge of Clojure. I had heard of it, but I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. Um, but I saw a talk by Jeff at uh, Go Go to Conf, and this guy Russ Miles, who's since become a friend of mine, and um, gave a couple of really amazing talks about architectural simplicity, right? And it's straight out of uh, Rich's book and all of you guys' book. Um, and here are his axioms. So. First one is, your software's first role is to be useful, right? So it doesn't matter how pretty it is. If it doesn't work, it doesn't do the job, then you're just wasting your time. The second thing is, and this is kind of hammock time uh, line, is the best software is that which is not needed at all, which is, we all know the story about that, about the cubicle houses. Um, the third thing, and this is really very much in, in line with what, what you guys are, are doing is that human comprehension is the most important thing. If people can't read or understand your code at a, at a certain technical level, then your code is not finished, right? So forget about unit tests, forget about anything else, right? If you can't show your code to your 
wife or your, uh, or your best buddy, right? And he doesn't understand it, it's not done. Uh, second thing is, and this is something that uh, is, and uh, Russ says that in, in a monarchy, it's, a, it's obviously a sexist monarchy, the king is, trumps the queen, right? Okay, but only just. And sometimes the true power is actually the queen. So that's why he, he gives that analogy. If your software does not actually use the systems and the infrastructure, etc., then you've also got questions to answer. So, and the next thing that was really appealed to me in what he's saying, and I think this is a huge thing in, in the whole closure world, and I think it's really important when you're, uh, when, you're bringing when you're bringing closure and the whole functional programming, this entire approach into the enterprise is that you need to explain that software, regardless of what it is, is always a process of R&D. And finally, and this is something that we neglect because we, we're looking too much at the details, software development is an extremely challenging intellectual pursuit. Right? This is a, there's a lot more science than engineering going on. Right? Engineering is when you have a really good model, when you know how to, you have a toolkit, then you just plug in the parameters of the, the river you have to bridge or whatever it is and the, the wind speed and all that kind of stuff, and you come out with a model. We can't do that in software. Every time we sit down to write a piece of software, it's full of unknowns. Okay, so some of the design decisions, um, and this is a bit shortened compared to what I intended to do, but I apologize for that. Um, number one, just use data, right? Obviously, this is uh, not news to you guys. Every single thing in the system is modeled using maps, vectors, and sets. There are no objects, there are no data structures, there are no, there's no encapsulation, there are nothing. Layers are vectors of columns, which are vectors of neurons. Neurons are a map of dendrites and disks. I'll show you the, the schema. Dendrites are etc. Right? Okay. And the whole thing is done in a one page datomic schema, which is that. And so there's a column, there's a neuron. And there's a dendrite, there's a synapse, and that's it. Right? So that's the entire design for a cortex. Right? Okay, this is the kind of thing you can do. Obviously, you guys know all about that. So, okay, number two, obviously, use closure and its ecosystem. So, closure data instead of domain objects, algorithms are just functions of data, components just look at data, and everything's composable, swappable, scalable. Use what I call standard libraries, which are just the most popular libraries in simple combinations. So, uh, number three, apply Russ Miles Life Preserver, which is his design. It's basically, it's a donut where you have the core in the middle and everything else is integration, infrastructure, interface, etc. cetera. Um, and in this case, the core is a datomic database for the neocortex. Each patch of neurons is a graph uh, that you saw a second ago. And everything else is in the integration layer, and you just put the components around there like that, and they talk to each other via the core. So you have algorithms, coders, classifiers, SDRs, visualizers, management metrics. It's quite a long list, but each thing is quite simple in and of itself, and it's already there are already good implementations of each of those things. So the key libraries I've used: uh, Datomic for the core, and ADI in places that. Schema is not actually literally the one I'm using, but it's, it's the one I'm using for kind of design work. Um, I'm using Quill and processing libraries for visualization of GUI, uh, Encounter for exploratory data science, which is it's fantastic. Um, and uh, this uh, Chris Zhang's line midget up is, I recommend, like if you come away with anything, right, check this thing out, it's just ridiculous. Okay, it's, watch his video. Download, download the thing, install it. Ten minutes later, your project will have been transformed. It's just, it's crazy. Uh, Hoplon Reveal JS for, for this presentation. The light table, I know everybody has their own religious thoughts about uh, what, what editors use. I uh, just never got, never got uh, patience for Emacs at all. So, okay, so just to sum up, um, big data is not just a machine intelligence problem. Uh, we need to understand and augment human intelligence. So HTM is an exciting R&D project. Uh, using Clojure's thinking and tools can change the game. And I would love to interest Clojure's great community in HTM. 
So there are some resources. Uh, the top one is Numenta. Oh, that's my blog. Find everything uh, coming off that. And that's Clortex as it stands at the moment. It's incomplete. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at Lambda Jam in about a month in Chicago. Uh, hopefully I'll have a, a working demo by then. There are a number of people queued up to, <coughs> to join the project. And uh, I'm also writing a book, which is on Mean Pub at the moment. You're, you're welcome to uh, read it for free. And if you want to support the project, you can, you can purchase it. Um, so thanks and adios. Thanks to Jeff, uh, Matt, and all my friends there. Uh, to Rich, Stuart, and an endless number of amazing people. I have a, a, a channel on uh, my YouTube which literally has like 150 related, related talks, many, many of them by people who are, who are going to be speaking here uh, over the next couple of days. Um, to Alex and Karen Meyer, um, in, I nearly fell off my bike when I heard this on the Cognicast. In February, she was at the same talk as Jeff at Strange Week last year, which is Alex's, one of Alex's conferences, and uh, she went to try and implement HTM in Clojure, and she ran up against what you've just seen, which is some of the kind of the learning curve of, of doing the, the neuroscience side of things. So she said, I wish somebody would do that, and uh, I emailed her the, that afternoon, and she has actually been uh, helping me out to things so thanks to her and um, so that would be it no sorry i don't know where that page came from so yeah okay thanks very much